So the software generation, so there could be the hardware generated interrupts, which as I said, you know, tends to deal with, you know, external peripheral hardware, network cards, video cards, keyboards, USB devices, things like that, that basically say like, hey, something occurred with my hardware, please deal with it, kernel. But there's also these software generated interrupts. So one of the things that can cause an interrupt is literally the interrupt instruction, and it can do interrupt n, where n is a particular interrupt number. So there's many different interrupts. We'll talk about the interrupt vector table here in a second, but um, basically, or interrupt descriptor table, uh, basically, this will invoke a specific interrupt from this interrupt descriptor table. Now, normally the table is used to handle various hardware conditions, but you can invoke those conditions with a software interrupt instruction. But you should be aware that essentially, while it is possible to software invoke these interrupts, um, the int instruction does not actually push an error code. So if you happen to be forcefully software invoking some interrupts number whatever, 13, and the interrupt handler assumes that there's gonna be an error code on the stack, well then you're going to, your stack's gonna be off and that's probably gonna screw up and just not really work. So, you know, just if for some reason you have to invoke uh, interrupts via software, keep that in mind. IRET, as we just said, is the interrupt return assembly instruction. And this is always going to be found at the end of interrupt handlers to basically get you back to the code that was running before popping all of these save state back into the relevant registers. There's also some more relevant software generated interrupts, particular int three. So int three, it's not like int space three, it's int three, that's a specific assembly instruction and it quite frankly took me a long time to realize that was actually literally a completely separate assembly instruction mnemonic. So int three, not int space three, has a special one byte form, hex cc. And so you will very frequently see this being used, well, sorry, you always see this being used as a uh, software breakpoint. But, you know, sometimes if you see someone like throwing in manual hex CCs, what they're doing there is they're specifically trying to say, if the RIP ever points at this data, then I want it to be treated like a software breakpoint and I want, you know, a debugger to be invoked, something like that. So we'll see in a lab here in a bit that CC is always going to be the software breakpoint. So if you happen to be in a debugger, that's going to have the debugger catch it. There's also an int one, and this is much more rarely uh, occurring, but it has a one byte form, hex F1. And this can be used for hardware makers who want to invoke a hardware breakpoint. So there's actually different, uh, when we see the interrupt descriptor table, we'll see there's different sort of uh, debugging mechanisms for int1 versus int3. And so, you know, Intel says that uh, the int1 can be used by hardware makers to invoke a sort of hardware breakpoint. So this might be like a, you know, BIOS vendor or something like that who sort of has like hardware attached at the very earliest part of the system when there's really no operating system up, there's nothing really to handle these things. Uh, and so sticking in an int1 will invoke the hardware breakpoint to let the hardware trap on it and allow them to bug the early execution of the system. But you won't see this very often um, in most normal operating system execution environments. And then finally, for completeness, we have these other ones, int o, which invokes the overflow interrupt, which is int 4, if the overflow flag in the R flags register is set to 1. So it's sort of like a conditional int 4. And so you might, for instance, be doing some math and you want to find out or interrupt if an overflow just occurred. Uh, and so basically you might do some code and then have an int o there and that will you know, invoke a interrupt if an overflow actually occurred in the math. And then UD2 is called the invalid opcode interrupt. And so there's a thing in the interrupt description table, interrupt six, which basically says someone somewhere tried to execute an assembly instruction that was actually completely invalid opcode. That's not something the processor knows anything about. And so while normally that might occur if someone has some garbage code they're trying to execute, uh, this is you know, sometimes used for someone just as a convenient way in order to suggest like, okay, well, let's, let's raise an interrupt and you know, what interrupt should we do? Okay, UD2. So these are infrequently seen, but I just list them as you know, other sources of software interrupts. All right, so just like we saw with call gates back in the call gates section, when we're talking about segmentation, interrupts are another mechanism that can be used to perform this 
privilege level escalation. So basically your code can be running along at current privilege level three, an interrupt occurs, and then it's going to break into the kernel and it's going to execute the kernel's interrupt handler at a privilege level of zero. And that's why there was that sort of difference of stacks of, is there a privilege level transfer? Is there no privilege level transfer? Uh, this is actually a very common way that operating systems used to invoke their system call mechanism in order to go from user space calling explicitly into the kernel. It's not so common anymore, but it is a way for privilege level transfer to occur. All right, now, so the question is going back to this, we said, okay, well, the stack pointer is pointing somewhere and then an interrupt occurs and information gets pushed onto the stack and then an irate occurs and it pops it back off the stack. The question is, where does this information get pushed onto the stack? And so in order to understand if there's this privilege level transfer and we go from ring three to ring zero, you know, where does the information actually get pushed? To find out about that, we're going to have to learn about a very old legacy mechanism of Intel hardware called tasks. And specifically, we're going to want to learn about the task state segment.